Hi, this is Dr. Sherry Schabowski from Medical Education in Minutes. And today we're going to be talking about upper and lower motor neurons, which can be confusing. So hopefully this video will help. Hi, I am Umberto, the upper motor neuron. I am a BET cell. My head represents my cell body or soma. My dendritic hairs receive information from the premotor cortex, the thalamus, the somatosensory cortex, and inhibitory interneurons. My axon is impressive. The axons of upper motor neurons can be as long as one meter. I live in the precentral gyrus, also known as the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe. Adjacent to the central sulcus and the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. The primary motor cortex is responsible for initiating and controlling voluntary movements. I myself am responsible for movements of the right thumb. My body is located in the gray matter along the brain's surface. My axon meets up with the axons of other motor neurons in the internal capsule, which is between the thalamus and the basal ganglion. Our axons are all myelinated and they make up the white matter in the brain. The axons pass through the pons and through the brainstem. At the level of the medulla oblongata, my axon, along with 90% of all motor axons, cross over to the opposite side. This crossover is called decussation. The other axons and I travel down the lateral corticospinal tracts until it's time to meet up with our lower motor neuron partners. 10% of the motor neuron axons do not cross over at the decussation. They travel in the anterior corticospinal tracts. These axons primarily control the trunk and axial muscles, and they cross the midline at the spinal cord level before synapsing with their lower motor neurons. As I said, I am an upper motor neuron that sends motor information about voluntary movement of the thumb, which in and of itself is a big job, but I also modulate and inhibit my partner lower motor neuron. Keep this in mind because if an upper motor neuron is damaged, the lower motor neuron gets a little crazy. And this is tough because I am a long neuron and I can be damaged in the cerebral cortex, the internal capsule, the pons, the brainstem, the cortical spinal tracts, and at the spinal cord level where I meet my lower motor neuron partner. So I am really vulnerable to damage. I release glutamate, which is my neurotransmitter, from my terminal axon. It crosses the synapse and is received by the lower motor neuron's dendrites. In this way, we share information critical to the voluntary movement of the thumb. But there is more. As an upper motor neuron, I provide inhibitory control to the lower motor neurons by activating interneurons. This inhibition maintains proper muscle tone. The inhibitory signals from upper motor neurons help maintain a balanced level of muscle tone and prevent muscles from becoming too stiff or rigid. This inhibition regulates reflexes as well. By inhibiting the lower motor neuron, 
upper motor neurons prevent it from overreacting to stimuli, ensuring that reflexes are not over-exaggerated. Finally, this inhibition is essential for voluntary movement. During voluntary movement, upper motor neurons activate both the lower motor neuron and other neurons to ensure smooth, coordinated muscle contractions. I have a lot of influence on the lower motor neuron. And as I said before, things go a bit crazy if I cannot share my information with him. Hi, I'm Luigi, the lower motor neuron. I am an anterior horn cell. My dendritic hairs receive information from sensory neurons, interneurons, and descending pathways from the brain and brainstem, including the lateral corticospinal tract. Among other things, I connect the motor cortex to the muscles. I am also a key player in reflexes. I take the information coming from the brain and facilitate the contraction of muscles. I do this by releasing acetylcholine from my terminal axons into the neuromuscular junction. When the receptors on the muscle receive acetylcholine, this triggers the contraction of the muscle. I also have the ability to trigger reflexes in response to sensory information. Sometimes there is a situation where there is no time for the sensory input to track all the way up to the brain to get an executive decision from the cerebral cortex. I mean, what if a person touched a hot pan on the stove? You would need a fast response to withdraw the hand before severe damage occurs, right? In this situation, I, Luigi, am there for you. Unfortunately, the pesty upper motor neuron inhibits my full ability to jerk the hand out of the way. But don't worry, I got you. You are clear. Now we know how everything is supposed to work. But what happens if something goes wrong? What if the person has a stroke and damages the upper motor neuron? Poor Umberto. If Umberto is blocked or damaged, the lower motor neuron will have no input from the brain. That means that there is no motor connection with the lower motor neuron, so its muscle is weak or not working at all. Further, the inhibition we talked about before is also blocked, so muscle tone will become more stiff and rigid and reflexes will be grossly exaggerated. This is called hyperreflexia. This all happens over time. The immediate response to stroke is spinal shock. Everything shuts down. This results in transient, transient I say, flaccid paralysis and no reflexes. But the response to lack of inhibition will ultimately dominate with hypertonicity of the muscles and hyperreflexia. Sure, there will be a little bit of atrophy in those muscles, but since they are still innervated by the reflex arc, it will never be as bad as when you have a lower motor neuron injury. What happens if the lower motor neuron is damaged? There will be no information sent to the muscles. There is no connection. The brain and Umberto are still fine, but now we lost Luigi. So there is no connection to the muscles. If you don't use it, you lose it. 
so atrophy of the muscles is prominent. Muscle tone is lost. The lower motor neuron is not working, so there are no reflexes. When there is no acetylcholine coming to the muscles, they do a weird thing. They upregulate their receptors because they are desperate for acetylcholine. It is possible that a little acetylcholine might drift into the synapse and stimulate that desperate muscle. This causes the muscles to twitch. This twitch is called fasciculations, and they are common in patients with lower motor injury. If you want a real live example of a fasciculation, think of when your eye twitches for no reason. It's not exactly the same, but it is the same phenomenon. Okay, let's review what we know. The origin of upper motor neuron injury is typically in the cerebral cortex, but it can be anywhere along the axon's track. Lower motor neuron injuries are going to occur in the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. When you have an upper motor neuron injury, you'll wind up with increased tone. That's because the upper motor neuron is not working and it can no longer inhibit the tonicity of the lower motor neuron. In the case of a lower motor neuron injury, the muscle will be flaccid. There's no innervation whatsoever. As far as reflexes go, with an upper motor neuron injury, you have lost inhibition. So therefore, you will be hyperreflexic. In the case of a lower motor neuron injury, you will have no reflexes. You've lost the motor neuron that causes reflexes. And then there are some special features. When you have an acute upper motor neuron injury, immediately you get low tone paralysis and areflexia. This is called spinal shock. Ultimately, it will manifest with the symptoms of hyperreflexia and hypertonicity that I spoke of earlier, but not immediately. A special feature of the lower motor neuron injury is fasciculations, those weird little twitches that come when the desperate muscles get a little bit of acetylcholine. All right. Thank you so much for learning with me today. This is a tough concept, and hopefully this video cleared it up a bit for you. But before I sign out, would it be okay if I go one step further? It makes what we have done so far seem simpler. Okay. Here's a crazy concept that's mostly based on anatomy. If there is an injury, like an anterior cord syndrome, the lower motor neuron in the anterior horn and the axons of the lateral corticospinal tract can be affected at the same time. If this were to happen, there would be flaccid paralysis at the level of the cord injury and upper motor neuron injury distally. That's just what you needed to have your mind blown at the end of a lecture. I know, sometimes it's just too much. But I'll see you next time. Thanks for learning with me today.